seven different types of cats. Um, I will be talking about real women um, as well as mythologies, and there are nuances in comparing mythological matriarchies with historical figures, as you will see, and I will discuss this briefly, but I won't have time to discuss this in detail. I also won't get into the topic of the Amazons um, and other talks because I have missed up a lot of things which are quite fascinating, but I hope that this will be a taster session that illuminates the breadth of possibility within this field of study. And also because my initial talk, um, thank you to Miriam for doing the draft with me, that was 45 minutes long. So I don't think we have time for that today. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention that I'm not centering my talk on Sappho since she is well established in the classical canon. For example, Plato called her the 10th muse and she's been elevated by Aristotle as well. I don't think it's a stretch to argue that her elevation by male authors was a significant factor in her fragments remaining the most visible um, of lesbians in current studies of classics. Um, I also do have a bibliography not on this PowerPoint, but um, do get in contact with me if you'd be interested in it. Um, I'm going to start off um, talking about queer theory in relation to classics. This will be largely based on the classics and literary theory module, but I'll briefly introduce the concept as preface to the following ideas. Foucault ar argues that it is difficult to find amongst the Greeks and Romans something you can call sexuality. And continuing on from this, some scholars have argued that it is anachronistic to apply modern labels such as bisexual, homosexual, or lesbian towards ancient societies which did not have this concept. With this in mind, I will be exploring ideas related to love in between women in a broader sense. Now, to move on to why lesbianism has been obscured, um, one of my sources here is an anthropological source, but I'm broadening to um, talk about classics in general. Firstly, in relation to the colonial suppression of non-Greco-Roman lesbians, my anthropological source discusses the feminist view of third world women as victims who were shackled to their marriage beds with no agency. However, whilst heterosexual marriage is the norm in most societies in the present day, this does not mean that sexual practices were all heterosexual. Um, another reason is that seen as secondary to male desires. Masculinity and masculine desire have been constructed as more valuable and powerful in patriarchal society. And as a result, women's sexuality was seen as limited or necessarily confined. This can be evidenced by classics as focus on pederastry in ancient Rome and the hierarchical sexual relations in ancient Rome. We um, can also talk about um, misinformation and this is where the um, narrative of heterosexual deprivation comes in. There is this idea that homosexuality resulted only from sex segregated conditions. For example, according to Carrier in 1980, European travelers would pass by Middle Eastern harems which were inaccessible to outsiders and hence felt forbidden. They would produce deeply exaggerated narratives of heterosexual deprivation based on their own sexual fantasies of the Orient. I'm going to move on to talk about cultural memory, um, which I think is quite, um, it pertains quite specifically to um, studies of the ancient world. Firstly, touching on oral history and material cultures. Since many ancient cultures passed down information through oral history and material cultures, which is why it's so important for us to look at archeological and anthropological evidence alongside our literary sources. Due to the lack of literary evidence for female homosexuality in comparison to heterosexual relationships and male homosexuality, it is easy to relegate the former to being a modern phenomenon. The writing down of a text did not mean that this was the original form, but rather a rewriting or reinterpretation uh, of oral forms or other writings. Um, an example would, of this would be the Rig Veda, which um, is a 10 volume collection of hymns written over a few centuries. In its present form, it often has contrasting meanings for the same div divinities, words and images. Um, and I'll touch on this a bit more later. I also wanted to talk about memory. Um, and as you can see the quote on my slide, that which is, remem is not remembered no longer exists. Um, and it can be said that it never existed. If you are interested in forgotten narratives, I recommend looking at the Amazons of Peru, who were disbanded and remain in people's memories, but not generally are known because of both colonial and post-colonial suppression after 1894. 
in relation to the classical ca canon and male authors. Um, in classics, we have upheld the canonization of sex texts, which are valued as more important than others to study, which marginalizes other texts. Of course, there are many reasons for this, which would take its own talk to describe, um, but it is partially due to the nature of the people who are copying these texts down and retelling the stories which they deem worthy of being retold, which means that it is more difficult to find ancient sources of homoeroticism, especially from women. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the picture on the left-hand side in Bhuvneshwa, um, which is the state of Odisha, um, formerly Orissa, in the eastern part of India, at Lingaraj Temple. Gita Thadani records um, the breasts um, of a statue of goddess being cut and polished over in um, what she says is a deliberate masculinization of female iconography. Um, with that in mind, I want to move on to the um, rewritten stories, um, sorry, that's still there, rewritten stories um, and ambiguity, um, homoeroticism and female friendships. I will talk about this a little bit more um, later in an example, but I wanted to touch on the term tribad, which comes from the Greek tribas to rub, which historically centers around the erotic potential of the clitoris. Ancient Greeks viewed the tribad as hypermasculine women who either penetrated women or men with their um, enlarged clitoris or a dildo. It wasn't until late antiquity that tribad was associated with same gender eroticism and it was replaced with terms such as lesbian or sapphist or homosexual. My point in mentioning this is that um, homoeroticism does not necessarily have to be um, a sexual thing and we will find sources um, that are not specifically about sex um, the same way that heterosexual relationships in sources are not necessarily just about sex. Um, the problem is also that we lack sources for female friendships, which is why um, texts can often be um, ambiguous. Um, now I will move on to the conflation of male and female homosexuality, um, which in my opinion is pretty much self-explanatory in that it was assumed that same-sex relationships would be the same for men and women. However, as we've discussed, um, based on women's positions in societies, um, it was not possible really to find sources from women in the same way, for example, being written down. Um, I want to move on now to bioessentialist narratives. Um, an example of this would be Sophistries by Leila J. Roop, um, which I found is an interesting text, um, since Roop argues that the problem is the, that um, Lesb um, lesbian evidence comes from men. Um, however, Roop also presents um, this argument that the inclusion of um, female bodied individuals who did not or do not consider themselves women, even if they did not or do not consider themselves men. She sees this as problematic, um, but she argues that she does not want to assume whether the figures she are, um, she's analyzing in um, lesbian histories were gender men or women. Um, she references Judith Halberstam in this, which I have quoted on the slide, um, discussing we cannot know for sure about the historical relations between same-sex desire and female masculinities. Um, this is a short-sighted argument because namely it excludes transgender women in antiquity. Um, and just for an example of transgender women in antiquity, if you're interested, the Gali, which were the um, Roman priests of Sibel, have been interpreted as predecessors to trans women. Um, so I can send you sources on that if you'd be interested. Um, I'm now going to move on to examples um, of representations of female homoeroticism. Starting um, with the monasteries in 5th century Egypt, um, these were integral to local economies, so we are lucky to have sources from monastic leaders um, since they viewed women's religious communities as sources of potential trouble which required constant supervision. So leaders would attempt to control the discourse in their writings. Um, I have sources um, on the screen for you now with the relevant parts highlighted in bold, namely firstly Taise, who runs after Sansano in friendship and physical desire and receives 15 blows of a stick as a punishment. 
Um, secondly, you've got Sansano, who um, is known for teaching other women in the monastery um, and also running after her name but in friendship amongst other crimes and receives 40 blows of the stick. In comparison, there's Densnoe, who um, has stolen amongst um, other crimes and receives 30 blows of the stick. Interestingly, the punishment for Tarase is less than Thesnoe, which um, it appears it means that her crime is less. Um, and for um, Sansano, the, um, the idea that Chanute seems to emphasize is that um, teaching is um, the real reason that um, Sansano is being punished. Chanute emphasized that he should be the one teaching as the leader of the monastery. I also want to emphasize that um, the desire that is mentioned in the Coptic translation is definitely erotic, though not necessarily genital specific, as I was mentioning earlier. The desire is qualified as physical or fleshly or carnal. Um, in ambiguous texts, the notion of female friendship often contributes the, to the erasure of homoeroticism, but the terminology of friendship is most often used um, euphemistically in Coptic sources to describe homoerotic relations between monastics. Um, I will now move on to the dual feminine in the Rig Veda um, from Gita Thodani's Sakyani. Um, so this is talking specifically about um, Sanskrit um, uses in the um, Rig Veda, um, where the generic feminine form was often expressed through the plural in Sanskrit in something that we call the dual feminine. Um, linguistically in Indology, Gyava is translated as masculine sky father, um, and in classics we will often compare this to Deus in Latin or Theos in ancient Greek. But actually, Gyava derives from the word Gyavao, which is the dualized feminine of the root Gyu, which means light. Um, and it's important to note that the move from the AU ending that you can see from, um, to the A ending is still the expression of the dual, but um, the dual is one unit, so it doesn't lose its dual identity. According to the um, author Todani, the textual evidence in the Rig Veda illustrates that the dual feminine can be interpreted as lesbian, which you can see in the quote on the slide, this dual cosmogony represents a holistic feminine union. Uh, and these twins can be seen as lovers, as mothers, and as sisters. In these early feminine cosmogenies, one does not find consorted deities in a heterosexual relationship, but dual deities of the same sex, often referred to as twins. They are also seen as dual mothers in feminine kinship genealogy, and they are seen as the first parents. Um, and in this way, the erotic and the sexual are implicit in the fusional intimacy of their bonding. You can see this um, with the quote on the slide and um, this idea that darkness and light, stillness and movement are different states of being when they are constellated in a circular frame. And it is only when they are implicated as a binary division that they become um, oppositions. So um, an example of this would be the goddess Usha in the Rig Veda, which um, Thodani's book um, has talks more about this. She could be defined in the singular, the generic plural, or the dual. Um, ego sexuality is not conceptualized on the basis of gender opposites or others, but as a fusional play of the diverse within the same self through a flow. I want to now move on to um, ancient China and examples there where um, the issue of evidence comes in, in that we have very little literary evidence. Um, my main scholarly source is Fang Fu Ruan, who argues that Chinese culture was characterized by a very tolerant attitude towards lesbians because women's supply of yin, which is the substance or the energy which is essential for the body, was believed to be unlimited in quality. So it was recognized that when a number of women were obliged to live in continuous and close proximity, lesbian relationships would form. One of the sources we do have is the paired dance of the female blue phoenixes, which is um, PowerPoint, um, which gave instructions for a man to enjoy two women at once and also permitted pleasurable genital contact between women. Um, another piece of evidence we have is um, the word morjingsa, which means robbing mirrors, um, and it's supposed to connote to lesbian sexual behavior um, without any stem-like projection. Interestingly, in the late 19th century, Mo Jing Dung um, was the rubbing mirrors party, which also contained lesbian relationships. Um, 
And according to Golden, Duisha, which is also on the slide, um, means eating each other. And that was also a euphemism for lesbian love, um, which you can see from the quote from Yung Shao, um, when ladies act towards each other as man and wife, it's called Duisha. Now I'll be moving on to Ovid and Iphis and Ainthi um, at the end of Ovid's book nine, Metamorphoses. So the gist of this myth is that um, a couple, Lygdus and Telethusa in Phaistos, were expecting their first child. Lygdus told his wife to bear him a son since they could not afford to have a daughter. Um, and if she were to bear a daughter, she would die. Um, with some godly intervention from the Egyptian goddess Isis, Telethusa gave birth to a girl, but raised them as a boy named Iphis. 13 years later, Lygdus found his son a bride, Ianthi, and they fell in love with each other. Iphis then expresses a wish to change their gender. Um, and this is where I would direct you to the quotes on the slide um, from Rayburn's translation, notably the second two, I wish I had never been born a woman, um, and the um, idea of um, both Iphis and I and Thee being um, able to be transformed. By the end of the myth, Iphis changes sex with the help of the goddess Isis and marries his bride, Ianthi. I want to now move on to um, scholarly interpretations of this, um, namely gesturing towards the first two bullet points of quotes. Um, the former is from Diane T. Pinterbone, who continually expresses Iphis's gender confusion. The latter quote also argues that Iphis's transformation threatens um, lesbian marriage. So the video froze for me. Is that okay? So it may be that Anya has some technical issues. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll elaborate more about this in a second. Um, but I want to move on to the third bullet point, um, which is LKM Maisel's position from their Adelon article, which argues that if all we mean by trans is not identifying as one's assigned sex, what harm is there? And in describing mythological characters as trans. Um, they say in Ovid's telling, Iphis is again only um, a girl in the sense of sex. Um, Maisel argues that Iphis's despondency, which you can see in that first bullet point from the slide, um, if heaven had wanted to spare me, it ought to have done so. Um, Maisel argues that this despondency is not about the incompatibility of their same sex desire with Iphis. Ianthi's um, expectation of a male spouse. Maisel argues that this is dysphoria about having a body sexed or gendered as female. And we can see this in the quote, I wish I had never been born a woman um, from the previous slide. Um, now moving on to the final quote on the page, I want to talk about um, Barish's interpretation of this myth. Um, since Barish argues that we need to take into account the fact that Iphis is fictional and that their words are really Ovid's words, um, since it's easy to be sympathetic to Iphis's speech if you imagine that they're a real person who is trans transgender or gay and feels isolation and self-loathing because of it. Um, however, Iphis's gender-bending relationship is immediately preceded by Biblis's feelings for her brother in the Metamorphoses, um, and it's followed in the next book by Pygmalion's love for a statue and Mira's incest. Um, in this way, Ovid, we can see that Ovid understood stood what we knew um, as LGBT as a overarching category. So our distinctions such as lesbianism, male homosexuality, and gender transformation as separate things within the metamorphoses may detract from the overall reading of the text um, based on just different cultural understandings um, of these things. Um, thus, Ovid is not quoting from his own experience, but something which is different from the norm, hence why this myth is put um, with other myths um, of incest um, and falling in love with a statue. I also want to highlight the difference between um, Barish, the final quote, and Maisel, which is the third quote. Maisel argues that Iphis's um, 
transness is explicit. I'm um, arguing that IFAS experiences dysphoria um, and he was raised as a man. Barish, however, argues for a lack of dysphoria based on the fact that um, Ovid is not really writing dysphoria in our modern conceptualization of transness. Um, to conclude, I want to say that um, using this myth as um, a sign that lesbians cannot get married unless one turns into a man is a reductive interpretation which doesn't fully grasp the nuances of the narrative and IFAS's gender. Um, I cannot specifically tell you whether a fictional character from a myth has dysphoria or define their distinct gender identity from these lines in Latin. And based on that, I cannot rule out IFAS's potential gender queer lesbian identity, so I cannot tell you whether IFAS and INT are lesbians or whether this is a heterosexual um, relationship. It does depend on your translations and interpretations of Ovid's Latin, which would take me an entire talk to get into myself. Um, but to me, this is still an LGBT story that doesn't explicitly fall into um, any subcategory. If you're interested in another narrative where there is discourse between lesbianism, you can look into the story of Megillos and Lucian's um, dialogue of the courtesans. Um, I want to now move on to reception of ancient Greece and my own ideas to conclude. This is um, Angelica Kaufman's The Artist in the Character of Design, listening to the inspiration of poetry. It's um, one of my favorite paintings. Um, specifically because it's been misinterpreted as showing a pre-transformed IFIS embracing Ianthi as if in a lesbian movie. However, based on the evidence on whom it was painted for and the title of the painting, it is unlikely that this was Kaufman's intent. Um, Barish argues that if it's only reception that is branded IFIS as queer, it's not really an integral part of understanding the story. And I agree to some extent, but I think that the queering of narratives, such as in this painting, arguably colours these stories, especially in the case of myths, which are meant to be subjective. Um, and just to conclude and relate this back to um, our cu curriculum, I think that re-examining the text that we have canonised and the reason why stories are told or untold um, is important and adjusting reading lists and bibliographies to include more diverse narratives such as these um, is quite helpful. Um, and I'll leave you with this final quote from Anne Barish. We should not normalise the mainstream as the default with the excuse of avoiding anachronism. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers and Miriam Leonard, who's my mentor, um, and everyone for coming. Thank you very much. Congratulations for this incredibly rich presentation. It was very useful and interesting. So I will now stop the recording for the discussion. Uh, just a second.